All right, so this is our last video on chapter 20. And in this video, we're going to be looking at what's going on in North America and Oceania. Kind of in time periods one through three. Now, like most societies, so we're gonna start with North America and we'll say something about Oceania towards the end of the video. Uh, like most of the societies we've looked at in the Western Hemisphere, North American societies did not have written languages. So a lot of what we know about them So a lot of what we know about them comes through archaeology and anthropology. Much like we studied hunter-gatherer societies, uh, we also get information. through the oral tradition. So kind of like how Sub-Saharan African societies passed down their histories, this is how North American societies would pass down their history. So the oral tradition continues uh, with the Native Americans that are still with us today. Now, we know comparatively less about these societies for a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of these societies were very small. These were small societies, so a figure like maybe 100 to 300 people. Who would occasionally meet in larger groups for religious or maybe economic purposes. So there just wasn't that many people in these societies. The other reason that we know less about these societies is that they encountered the Europeans later than the people in Central or South America. And that's not to say that they, the Europeans are better or anything, it's just to say that the Europeans had written language and recorded their encounters.
so our first written knowledge of people in North America comes through the Europeans, but they come along much later in North America than they did in Central or South America. So we know less about them because we got less of their history. Another thing to keep in mind about North American society is that unlike the people in Central America or South America, people in North America lived in just about every different type of climate zone. There aren't that many climate zones in Central America or South America, but North America has just about everything from tundra to tropical rainforest. So, for example, the Inuit people in what is now northern Canada lived as hunters and gatherers basically living off of whales And there's some record that they interacted with the Vikings. On the other edge of North America, the Tequista people lived in the Florida Keys and they hunted and gathered there. And these people interacted with the native people of the Caribbean who first encountered Columbus. So there's not a single idea of who the North American people were because the Inuit people are very different than the Native Americans of Florida. So there's a big variation amongst people who lived in North America. Now, there are a few exceptions, and it's always interesting to bring up the exceptions to these rules. So, there were a few larger societies of North American people. Uh, so, one of these groups is the Iroquois. The Iroquois were a kind of loose association of five tribes of people, and they kind of all made decisions together. There was some kind of small scale agriculture. Uh, 
but like the sub-Saharan Africans, there was no ownership of land. So you would you would plant crops or grow crops on shared land and you would all kind of reap the benefits of the agriculture. But they were also pretty warlike and expanded their hunting grounds. at the expense of their neighbors. Another group of people that were kind of an exception to this uh, were the Pueblo. And they're uh, kind of in the southwest United States. Uh, the Iroquois are what we would kind of think of now as being in New York. So the Pueblo are kind of in the southwest United States and they built uh, extensive I guess homes in caves in the desert southwest. Maybe the best example of that is at the Chaco Cultural National Historic Site. So if you ever get a chance to go out to the Four Corners, that's where that is. Another exception to this might be Cahokia. Cahokia was a, or it still is, a large earthen mound near what is now St. Louis, Illinois. And this was used as a uh, like a center of a large trade network. So people from all over the Mississippi River Valley would come to Cahokia to trade. But that's, with the exception of those three, three societies, North American society was, was small. It was mostly hunting and gathering. Uh, they didn't have written language. And so when we look back on it, it looks like there wasn't much going on. That's not the truth. It's just that we don't know what was going on. And we have to look at it through the eyes of, other sciences like archaeology or anthropology to kind of give us a fuller understanding of what was going on there. Um, just kind of the last place we haven't really looked at is Oceania. And this is the Society of the Pacific Islands.
I wouldn't necessarily consider this part of the Western Hemisphere, but some of it is. Um, the largest land masses here would be Australia. And Australia was hunting and gathering until the British showed up. in the 1700s. So pretty much what we talked about at the very beginning of our course about hunting and gathering, that's what was going on in Australia until the 1700s. The other important landmass here would be uh, Papua New Guinea. which is the large island north of Australia. And here they did develop some agriculture. Now, when we think about the Pacific Ocean itself and the islands here, in the Western Pacific, kind of closer to Australia, there was a quite a bit of trade and connection and this typically led to peaceful coexistence the eastern pacific and think about where like hawaii is is much more isolated. So culture spread very slowly. It did spread, but it spread very, very slowly. We know that it spread because uh, food crops spread across islands. Most importantly, the sweet potato, which acted like rice or bananas. So this was the staple crop. This is what allowed the population to grow. So in the Pacific, it was the sweet potato, which acted like rice did in Eurasia, or bananas did in Africa. The sweet potato is what allowed populations to grow in the Eastern Pacific. We also see fishing techniques spread across islands, specifically between Hawaii and Tahiti. So we see things like fishing hooks. appear in both places, the same type of fishing hooks. And we also note that like the Bantu people, these people migrated 
due to population pressures. Okay, so that's it for time period three. That is our last video on time period three. Uh, so our next video will start with time period four and pretty much explain why the Europeans are going to start exploring, which we've already kind of hinted at in these videos on the Western Hemisphere. So our next set of videos will start in Europe and start asking the question, why did the Europeans start exploring? Why did they eventually show up in the Western Hemisphere? Uh, but until then, this is the end of time period three, and this is Mr. Nissen signing off.